the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, Tank Turret Crews, Round Study, Mid-Tier Rockets, and Metal Beasts, King of Phantoms. The F-4 Phantom II fighter bomber family needs no special introduction. Its first member was added to War Thunder around three and a half years ago and instantly scored a lot of favor among the players. The line got extended with time, and the Phantom gradually became such an international aircraft that it managed to receive its own personal triathlon. Today's Metal Beast is the 14th model of the series, one of the most modern versions of the F-4, the Israeli Kurnos 2000. This machine is propelled by a twin turbojet engine with afterburners. Self-sealing fuel tanks are found in the fuselage and the wing consoles, and the nose hides the radar system and the forward-firing 20mm autocannon with an ammo pool of 640 rounds. The aircraft can carry conventional bombs of various calibers, rockets, gun pods, infrared and radar-guided air-to-air missiles, as well as high-precision air-to-surface munitions and a targeting pod. You can also enhance your defenses with additional countermeasure pods. In their attempts to match the potential of modern fighters, the engineers added some new electronic equipment to the old Phantom, installed a powerful radar station, and gave it more advanced armament. Unfortunately, it did nothing to improve its flight performance, so the upgrades make for a peculiar situation. The aircraft has one of the best missiles in the game and plenty of them. The radar helps it to use them efficiently too, but the F-4 still can't catch up with fourth-generation fighters, much less win a turn fight against them. With these circumstances in mind, here's our recommendation for the Kornas. In air combat, keep your distance and work your AIM-7 missiles. If you love the old-school cannon fire, there's an alternative. Take some gun pods and hit your enemy with 40 kilograms of one-second burst mass. Just make sure you lock onto your targets with the radar on time so that your computer helps you with the lead. And of course, remember about additional countermeasures. The Kurnos's main highlight is its assault potential. It truly justifies the name, which by the way means sledgehammer in Hebrew. The unguided arsenal here is predictably rich, and there's also a special offer in the shape of precision munitions two types of infrared-guided bombs, and IR-homing Maverick missiles. The former are much cheaper, but bring a few flaws. Their speed is pretty low, and the targeting pod is inconvenient, since it lacks both a thermal imager and an auto-tracker. Still, even manually controlled bombs aren't that hard to land right onto the enemy's roofs. The Mavericks are better suited against enemy anti-aircraft systems. They don't need the pilot to do anything after the launch, allowing them to focus on evasive maneuvers. Well, that's what the new King of the Phantoms is like. Never in a rush, and mighty strong, as befits a true monarch. It'll never let you down and stay a decent part of the family collection. In many tanks, the gunner sits on the left of the cannon, while the loader sits on the right. Have you ever wondered why? It does seem a little strange if you think about it. Most people on Earth are right-handed, so it would be more convenient for the loader to be on the left and use their right hand to push the heavy rounds. Meanwhile, the gunner would enjoy sitting on the right so that their right hand was on the horizontal drive flywheel. It's hard to rotate the turret even on light tanks, and most people's strongest hand is their right. Still, many countries used an irrational crew layout for many years, where the gunner sat on the left and the loader was on the right. The Germans, for instance, only swapped them after the war with the Leopard tank, and the Soviet Union never made the switch in the end. So we can't help but ask, if the tanks had guns developed specifically for them, why didn't the engineers think through crew layouts? The answer to that is both simple and tricky. It's a tradition. You see, naval and garrison guns had their flywheels on the left. Such guns were never meant to have 360-degree rotation, and using the left hand was enough to aim in a limited sector. 
There was another system in use as well that had a shoulder rest instead of the flywheels. It had the gunner sit on the left, carrying the load on their right shoulder. That system carried over to the ground armored vehicles. The first turreted tanks were made by the French, like the huge FCM 2C. Its gun could only be aimed by rotating the turret, with the gunner sitting on the left and using their left hand on the drive. It was by no means convenient, but having a turret was already an achievement. Now, light French tanks had a different system altogether. The commander would control the turret by rotating the flywheel and then aim the gun with the use of the shoulder rest. The gun used on those machines was pretty small. It connected to a frame and could aim without rotating the turret. With time, calibers grew and turrets got heavier. The Somua 35 got an electric drive for the turret and a flywheel for gun depression. The conservative Brits, however, kept the shoulder rest for vertical guidance on both the two and the six pounder guns. Only the Centurion with its heavy 17 pounder replaced shoulder rests with flywheels and the gunner finally traded places with the loader. American vehicles had a similar path. The light 37 mm gun had a shoulder rest on the left for aiming, but the Sherman received a reworked turret layout. The heavier the rounds got, the more appropriate that decision seemed. And the first nation to place the gunner on the right side of the turret was, as surprising as it may sound, the Italians. The M13 already had the loader on the left, using their right hand to send the round into the breach. Now, the Japanese sure love their traditions. They were among the last. Of course, they couldn't help but discard the shoulder rest for the 75mm guns, but they still moved the gun horizontally without rotating the turret for the longest time. The gunner was only moved to the right after the war. The Germans, of course, paved their own way. The gunner was kept on the left, but the flywheels were moved so that they could rotate the turret with their right hand. Loaders, however, had to endure the effort all the way until the 1950s, when the new crew layout was finally introduced. Soviet engineers saw the German turrets as early as the 1930s, but for some reason they never swapped the flywheels or the crew members. The only time when they thought about moving the loader left was in 1943, when they were developing a new 100mm gun. Thanks to Vasily Grabin, a famous artillery designer, Object 248 got a mirrored turret layout. But the new gun failed the tests, so the mass-produced tanks kept their old layout. After the war, the Soviets developed a stabilizer and soon after, an autoloader. With those technologies, it didn't matter where the loader or the gunner sat anymore. We often see your comments under triathlon episodes asking us to expand the format and make a contest for weaponry in addition to vehicles. It's a great idea, but we don't think it suits the spirit of the triathlon. Similar types of weapons don't have enough differences to have a series of full-scale tests. Besides, a lot depends on the carrier, so the scoring might feel a bit unfair. On the other hand, we have got the round study a section made specifically for comparing similar munitions and highlighting their pros and cons. Let's start our inquiry with medium-tier high-explosive rockets. We'll pick the most popular ones for the testing. The American HVAR, the German Werfergranat 21, the Soviet ROFS-132 and M13, the British RP-3, the Japanese Type 5 No. 6 Mod 9, the French T-10-140, and the Swedish M49 and M51. We'll be rating their efficiency against various ground targets. To see how they perform, the targets will gradually increase in difficulty. The ZSU-37, the Sherman, and the King Tiger. Let's start with the simplest one. Almost all rockets can incapacitate the crew even when hit a couple meters off the target. The French T-10 has the biggest trouble here, requiring an almost direct hit. The reason for this is the low amount of explosives. 2.5 kilos isn't too shabby, but it's certainly less than what the competition offers. With more armor come more issues. Most of our rockets can only incapacitate the medium tank by scoring a direct hit to the roof. The large caliber participants show more impressive results. The Swedish M49, the Japanese Type 5, 
and the German Werfergranat 21 only need to hit somewhere close to the tank. Now the King Tiger is completely invincible to most rockets. The only exceptions are again the large caliber ones and the British RP-3. The latter has just enough penetration for the roof of the heavy, but of course, it needs a direct hit. So the shooting results tell us we can divide the rockets into two groups. The light ones, such as the RP-4, the M13, and the HVAR, are good against open-top machines and can also sometimes be used against lightly armored enclosed vehicles. The heavy ones, including the M49, the Type 5, and the Werfergranat 21, are suitable against most ground targets. The amount of explosives and the penetration rates are important, but you should also remember the performance of the carrier. Where are the hard points on the aircraft? How many rockets can it take? Are they launched one by one or in pairs? And finally, can this machine exit a sharp dive? The success formula has many variables, and the most important one among them is the pilot's accuracy. At least when they don't have a ballistic computer. Tell us in the comments what weapons you'd like to see next. Meanwhile, it's time for us to answer some of your questions. The first question was sent by a player called WellGGBro. What's the difference between the GBU-8 and the GBU-15? Hi, bro! The GBU-15 is just a more modern version, with improved fins. It has almost no effect on combat efficiency. Hans the Soldier asks, Which tank is better, T-34, T-30, or T-29? Hi, Hans! We'd like to give the T-30 a separate category since its usage is vastly different from the other two. If we had to choose between the T-29 and the T-34, the former wins hands down. It offers a higher rate of fire and some capped rounds. On the other hand, the T-29 also has a higher battle rating than the T-34, so it meets much stronger enemies. Another question comes from the biggest Star Wars fan. When will the P-47D-25 get its drop tank? It used it during the invasion of Normandy. Hello there! We prioritize adding drop tanks to planes that often can't last a whole battle on a single standard fuel load. The Thunderbolt has enough volume in its internal fuel tanks to last the entire fight in the air in most modes. Mr. Unavailable writes, how long after you post a video do the people that pick the comments for the next shooting range stop? Hey, Mr. Unavailable, we're checking and reading your comments even a month after an episode airs. So don't worry if you don't see an answer to your question next week. And the last comment for today was written by the wrong pilot. Can the British active protection system on the Challenger be effective against artillery? Hi there! The Challenger APS has a limited guidance sector, but if an artillery shell does get within range, the APS will intercept it. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to set up keybinds for the shoulder rest and the turret flywheels in simulator mode. Leave a like. Share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.